It is a joy and a privilege to be with you all here in Wittenberg today. And I want to briefly take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this opportunity to gather here. And we ask you that with your Holy Spirit, you would be the one who is speaking into our lives through your very word. May you be exalted, lifted up, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. We have already heard that there are two key central teaching in the Reformation. One is sola scriptura, scripture alone, absolutely key, very much the foundation. Another key central teaching is sola fide, justification by faith alone. They are obviously very, very important. Now, this afternoon, we're look, looking at another teaching of the Reformation called Every Christian a Priest, or sometimes the expression is used, priesthood of all believers. So, this is about every Christian a priest, and we're going to look at three main points the first main point is where in the Bible got Luther this notion of every Christian a priest? Where in the Bible did he get that notion of every Christian a priest? The second main point is one mediator versus multiplied mediators. One mediator the Lord Jesus Christ versus what the Roman medieval church had done in multiplying mediators. And the third main point this afternoon is why the Christian's direct access to God through Jesus Christ is so important. Let's look at the first main point where in the Bible got Luther the idea, the notion of every Christian a priest. And that's not only something we find in the New Testament, we already find that in the Old Testament. I'm starting off with Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Already in Exodus, early on in Scripture, you shall be to me a kingdom of what? A kingdom of priests. When we jump to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. And then in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen race, and look how he continues, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And also in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. If you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Bible says you are actually called to be a priest. Every Christian a priest. And so as we think about it, let's also look at the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one passage in Psalm 110 verses 1 through 4, that's the passage from the Old Testament which is quoted more often in the New Testament than any other Old Testament passage. And in that passage, we learn 
that Jesus Christ is called a priest forever. I'm reading Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We learn in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is actually the final high priest and he himself became the sacrifice. Beautiful passages in Hebrews chapter 7 and 10, starting in chapter 7 in verse 17. For it is witnessed of him, Jesus Christ, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever." Every Christian, a priest, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are called, says the Bible, to be a priest. And look at what a great and final high priest we have in Jesus Christ. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet." For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This notion of every Christian a priest is something that we clearly find in Scripture, which leads us to the second main point, one mediator versus multiplied mediators. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Again, crystal clear. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and men. Sadly, the medieval church, the medieval Western church, had multiplied mediators between God and human beings. And that is also not surprising if you think about the fact that fallen sinners, they love to have power over people. They love to be in charge. They love to be in control. That's one of the things that Luther wrote about the church. We heard already this morning about a Diet of Worms in 1521. And Luther obviously was very much pressured to recant. And we heard about a couple of books that, that were in front of him. And we're going to now look at two of those, of those books 
that were in front of him as he was being asked, will you recant? The first one is a little book that he wrote in August of 1520 with the title Address to the Nobility of the German Nation. And the second one is from October 1520 entitled The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. In this first work from August 1520, addressed to the nobility of the German nation, Luther attacked three abuses of the Roman medieval church, and he called them the three walls. The, third, the first abuse, the first wall, was the class distinction between full-time Christian workers, priests, pastors, missionaries, versus ordinary Christians. That was the first wall, the first abuse. And the Catholic Church, he said, they had put up all this stuff to protect themselves from criticism. The second abuse, the second wall, was that, the, that they claimed that the Pope is the only one who has the authority to interpret Scripture. That was the second abuse, the second wall. And the third wall is that they said only the Pope can call a church council. Let me quote you a couple of things out of this address to the nobility of the German nation. It is a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worth to hear Luther's heart, his words, to better understand why this whole thing with every Christian a priest is actually, for us today, an important teaching. The Romanists have, with, have drawn three walls around themselves with which they have pro protected themselves so that no one could reform them, whereby all Christendom has fallen terribly. And then he lists the three abuses, the three walls. And I'm now going to jump into what he writes at the beginning about the first wall. Again, that is the class distinction between full-time Christian workers, priests, pastors, missionaries, versus ordinary Christians. And he writes, let us in the first place attack the first wall. It has been devised that the Pope, bishops, Priests and monks are called the spiritual estate. Princes, lords, and peasants are the temporal estate. This is an artful lie and hypocritical device, but let no one be made afraid by it. And that for this reason, that all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate, and there is no difference among them, save of office alone. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we are all one body, though each member does its own work to serve the others. This is because we have one baptism, one gospel, one faith, and are all Christians alike. For baptism, gospel, and faith, these alone make spiritual and Christian people. As for the unction by a pope or a bishop, ordination, consecration, and clothes differing from those of laymen, all this may make a hypocrite or an anointed puppet, but never a Christian or a spiritual man. Thus, we are all consecrated as priests by baptism, as St. Peter says. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and in the book of Revelation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests. For if we had not a higher consecration in us than pope or bishop can give, no priest could ever be made by the consecration of pope or bishop, nor could he say the mass or preach or absolve. Therefore, 
the bishop's consecration is just as if in the name of the whole congregation he took one person out of the community, each member of which has equal power, and commanded him to exercise this power for the rest. In the same way as if ten brothers, co-heirs as king's sons, were to choose one from among them to rule over their inheritance. They would all of them still remain kings and have equal power, although one is ordered to govern. And to put the matter even more plainly, if a little company of pious Christian laymen were taken prisoners and carried away to a desert and had not among them a priest consecrated by a bishop, and were there to agree to elect one of them, born in wedlock or not, and were to order him to baptize, to celebrate a mass, to absolve and to preach, this man would as truly be a priest as if all the bishops and all the popes had consecrated him. That is why in cases of necessity, every man can baptize and absolve, which would not be possible if we were not all priests. Now, you can very well imagine that the medieval Roman church did not like the things that Luther was writing here. One other shorter paragraph, we see then that just as those that we call spiritual or priests, bishops or popes do not differ from other Christians in any other or higher degree, but in that they are to be concerned with the word of God and the sacraments, that being their work and office, in the same way the temporal authorities hold the sword and the rod in their hands to punish the wicked and to protect the good. A cobbler, a smith, a peasant, every man has the office and function of his calling, and yet all alike are consecrated priests and bishops. And every man should by his office or function be useful and beneficial to the rest so that various kinds of work may all be united for the furtherance of body and soul just as the members of the body all serve one another. That's what Luther wrote about the first abuse, the first wall, the class distinction between full-time Christian workers and ordinary Christians. And he was not in any way more supportive of what I wrote about the Pope being the only one to interpret Scripture. I'm going to read you just a little bit of what he writes there. Therefore, it is a wickedly devised fable, and they cannot quote a single letter to confirm it, that is for the Pope alone to interpret the scriptures or to confirm the interpretations of them. They have assumed the authority of their own selves, and though they say that this authority was given to St. Peter when the keys were given to him, it is plain enough that the keys were not given to St. Peter alone, but to the whole community. Besides, the keys were not ordained for doctrine or authority, but for sin to bind or lose. And what they claim besides this from the keys is mere invention. But what Christ said to St. Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, cannot relate to the Pope inasmuch as the greater part of the Popes have been without faith. As they are themselves forced to acknowledge, nor did Christ pray for Peter alone, but for all the apostles and all Christians. As he says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Is not this plain enough? So Luther clearly attacked those three abuses, those three wars that the Roman medieval church had put up. And then in October 1520, he wrote the Babylonian captivity of the church. In this little book, Luther attacked the sacramental system of the medieval Roman church. And I'm going to read you a short quote by Reverend Moldenhauer. As Babylon held Israel captive, 
Now the papacy was holding Christians in bondage by Rome's theology and use of the sacramental system. Rome's sacramental system had and still has seven sacraments. Luther considers each one in turn. He, ma he maintains that only three of the seven are sacraments, baptism, penance, and the bread that is communion. These three remaining sacraments, Luther writes, are held captive by the Roman church. So Luther was attacking in the Babylonian captivity of the church those sacraments, and now especially looking at communion, the Lord's Supper. And what they had done is they would not give to ordinary Christians the cup. They were withholding the cup from ordinary Christians. The wine, the blood of Jesus Christ was only for the priest. Luther fiercely attacked it because it is utterly unbiblical. I'm quoting very short quotes here from this very book, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. But further, if the church can withhold the wine from the ordinary Christians, it can also withhold the bread from them. It could therefore withhold the entire sacrament of the altar, which is communion, the Lord's Supper, from the ordinary Christians and completely annul Christ's institutions so far as they are concerned. I ask, by what authority? But if the church cannot withhold the bread or both kinds, neither can it withhold the wine. This cannot possibly be contradicted, for the church's power must be the same over either kind as both over both kinds. And if she has no power over both kinds, she has none over either kind. I am curious to hear what the Roman flatterers will have to say to this. And then he says, the sacrament does not belong to the priests, but to all. And the priests are not lords, but ministers, in duty bound to administer both kinds to those who desire them, and as often as they desire them. Luther is saying in the Babylonian captivity of the church that withholding the cup from the ordinary Christians is utterly unbiblical. He also made very clear that his teaching of transubstantiation is wrong, is heretical. And he also made clear that mass is not a sacrifice offered to God. Regarding baptism, Luther makes very clear in this book that you need to have saving faith. Otherwise, you will not be justified. You need to have saving faith. And then regarding penance, Luther shows clearly that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then you are forgiven. I know these were not easy matters, looking at these long quotes, looking at these two actual books that were there at the Diet of Worms in 1521. Let's make this a little bit more practical for us today with the third main point, which is why the Christian's direct access to God through Jesus Christ is so important. And again, remember 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You don't need to have a professional priest. You don't need to have a Catholic priest for you to be absolved from your sins. If you have direct access to God through Jesus Christ, as we just read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, then you can come with your sins directly to Jesus Christ, to God himself, and you will be forgiven. You don't need a professional priest or Catholic priest. You can go straight to Jesus Christ, and so you know, I am forgiven, and you can know for sure, God in Jesus Christ loves you. That which you and I so easily and so often forget in daily life, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you are deeply loved by 
eternal God. You are loved by Jesus Christ and you have your identity in Jesus Christ. Christ's righteousness is credited to you. All the important things in your life are already settled. It is fine. And I know that some of you are going through very difficult seasons, wilderness, storm, whatever. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have confessed your very sins to Almighty Holy God, and you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe that He is indeed a Son of God, that He died for your sins and He is risen from the dead, if He is your Lord, your sins are forgiven. And it is good with you, no matter the challenges that you are still facing in this life. And that also gives you then the boldness to go and run to the throne of grace. In Hebrews chapter 4 we read, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find Christ to help in time of need. That means you can come boldly with direct access to God through Jesus Christ. All of this has, of course, to do with the gospel and your assurance, your identity in Jesus Christ, His righteousness credited to you, but it has not only to do with the gospel and with your assurance, it also has to do with Christian ministry today. How you are serving as a Christian in the world. And let's be honest today about the fact that this first abuse that I quoted earlier, the class distinction between full-time Christian workers, missionaries, church planters, pastors versus ordinary Christian is still an issue today. It's not just an issue of the Roman Catholic Church. It's also an issue in Protestant churches as well. And Luther made very clear and said, it's not just the church planters and the pastors or the priests who have a calling from God. A teacher has a calling from God. A banker has a calling from God to be a Christ-loving, Christ-exalting banker. If you're a lawyer, if you're a carpenter, or whatever, Luther was very strong on the fact that ordinary Christians just as much have a calling as a church planter or a missionary. And what you do and what you don't do is really, really important. When I was ordained as a pastor, one of the things that you experience then is that suddenly all the time they ask you to pray, and please don't misunderstand me. I absolutely love to pray. Why? When I pray, I actually commune with Almighty God. And I experience and I know His incredible love for me in Jesus Christ. I love to pray. So please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. But I was wondering, why is it always like that? that now that you're ordained, you have to pray at every birthday party or before any food. Are there any other Christians out there who actually can pray and thank God for the food? And so the point is, Jesus Christ has called every believer, in a sense, to be a priest. 
And so we shouldn't just have specialists for the word and for prayer. And again, please do not misunderstand me. I'm absolutely for good, excellent seminary training. I'm profoundly grateful for Ligonier Ministry. We need to have pastors who are very, very well trained in the word and who also love to pray. But the point is, what about all the other Christians, the ordinary Christians? And what Luther is saying with this expression of every Christian a priest is, he, I think, is challenging ordinary Christians and also pastors who are preaching, because they are oftentimes the problem, to say that you as ordinary Christians, you shouldn't just say, okay, I don't need to know all that stuff from the Bible because I have a pastor. You should actually be running to the Bible, the Word of God, and really know Scripture very well and very deep. When we started landing Gospel Church München in Munich, Germany, a little, well, a little less than five years ago, initially I thought in the worship services I have to do everything preach and lead through the service and so on. And of course, a worship service needs to very much be God-centered, not man-centered. It is about the glory of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not a show to draw a crowd. It's about God himself worshiping him, exalting Christ. But maybe about two years into it, some of the men rightly challenged me and said, Stefan, how about if we have some of the other more mature men also help lead through the services? And that has been, I think, a very wise step. Now remember, South Munich, where we are, is an incredibly secular area. So it's very tempting as a pastor to think you need to do everything. And of course, you do need to have quality control. It needs to be God-centered. But by God's grace, we have six men who are taking turns lead, helping lead through the service. And one of the very interesting things that I've seen and experienced is that it actually has tremendously spurred these men on to go deeper with the Word of God and prayer. When they say a prayer, they sit down at home during the week, really think through what should I pray for in corporate worship service. They write it out. It has made them become more like Christ. And not only this, these are men, most of them with quite strong, high responsibilities. And it has changed their view of the, of the economy. I think of one guy being a CEO in the financial services industry. It has tremendously changed his view on how he should live as a Christian Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. It has spurred him on to go deeper with the Bible, the Word of God and prayer and to not only live that on Sunday in a worship service. And again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm strongly for this biblical idea principle that the Lord really invented, this whole idea, this notion of a local church. And I know that in Germany, we need to elevate a local church. We need to elevate a local church in America. But it has been so very helpful to see how the Lord has tremendously changed these men. And again, pastors need to be very good with the Bible and preaching and prayer, but it is not wrong for ordinary Christians to also go very deep with Scripture and with prayer, and by God's grace to be very much changed in the likeness of Christ and to live that out then more in daily life. Every Christian a priest. I believe if we take that more seriously, this notion of every Christian a priest, 
if you go deeper with the Word of God and prayer and understand, that's absolutely true and relevant in daily life. I believe that we will see more Christians in the business world, in the hospitals, in the schools, in the universities, confronting sin. Confronting sin and not be silent about sin in the workplace or in the school or the university. Opening up our mouths and saying, look, it's wrong. And why is it wrong? Because of the Word of God says it. Confronting sin. That's a priestly act. That's how you actually put that into practice, into daily life. Every Christian priest, in the workplace, you speak up and you say, this is wrong, it's sin, you stand up for righteousness. You work with excellence at the workplace, or you're an excellent student in school, to the glory of God. That's another way of how you actually are a priest as a Christian. Or as a Christian in your family, in your community, in your neighborhood, with your relatives, wherever, you are actually becoming more of ministers of reconciliation. That's what Luther is talking about. As you go deeper with the Word of God and with prayer, living that out more boldly in daily life and saying, look, what it is really about is that we are called by God to be ministers of reconciliation. To talk to people in the workplace at the right time, maybe over lunch or whenever, and say, look, be reconciled to God. We just talked the other day with one of the guys in our church, works for one of the major companies in Munich, and he said that they have a prayer group with a couple of guys from his company. They meet early in the morning. And he said, what I realized is we were just mainly praying for our company to do well and, you know, to have success, and it's fine to pray for these things. But he said, you know what we really need to pray for, especially is for all those other people in our company who are lost, who are going to hell if they are not saved. And so when Luther says every Christian a priest at the workplace, in school, wherever you are, you have a kingdom-minded focus and you minister and you serve. That's how you are a priest. Every Christian a priest. And I've talked about the fact that this direct access to God through Jesus Christ, that you and I can come boldly, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you can come boldly with confidence. And I want to cheer you on to do that much and often. And please don't make the mistake to think that we have all these just seminary trained guys. They kind of, you know, they cover all of that. Of course, they need to be very godly men and they need to be bold with the word and they need to pray and so on. But don't we think that the Lord would mightily work if we pastors would be more clear and bold in this teaching of Luther, every Christian priest, and say, look, we want you to be more engaged in church, but also during the week, take those great truths of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom and flesh them out in daily life. Confront sin. Be minister for, ministers of reconciliation, work with excellent, excellence to God's glory. And I believe that as you and I can boldly run to the throne of grace, I believe the more we do that, the more I think you and I will be 
encouraged and strengthened to more boldly go out into the world as Christians who see themselves as a teacher who is called by God to very much glorify Jesus Christ in numerous ways. And so Martin Luther is cheering and encouraging and spurring you and I on, not just for the missionaries and church planters and so on, but for the ordinary Christians. Be strong in the word and in prayer, and by God's grace, become more bold. What, what people need wherever, school, university, workplace, they need Jesus Christ and the gospel. And it is not loving for you and I if we withhold that from them. Every Christian, a priest, with great joy, run to Jesus Christ, run to Almighty God through Jesus Christ, and that will empower and strengthen you with great freedom and boldness to go out into the world and to be a priest wherever God has called you and has placed you, maybe as a husband, maybe as a father, maybe as a mother, maybe as a teacher. No matter where he has placed you, he has called you to, by God's grace, be a priest so that the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified, but also that people hear this message, the gospel, this message of reconciliation. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much that you have given us men like Martin Luther, who simply have pointed out biblical truths. And you know, Father, how easy it is for us today, I know both in the States as well as in Germany, to kind of separate Sunday and church and all of that Jesus Christ Bible from daily life. Father, forgive us for where we have been so silent, so passive. Lord Jesus, you have given everything for us. You have given your very life. And so, Father, I pray with this whole notion of every Christian a priest, I pray that you would spur us on by the power of the Holy Spirit to joyfully go out in our, into our families and neighborhoods and schools and so on, Father, and to, by God's grace, minister and serve as priests of the great high priest, the priest forever, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is the sacrifice. Jesus' name, amen.